tal? ¿Cómo están? Soy Carla Munguía Colmenero. El día de hoy traigo una entrevista muy especial con una persona espectacular, de las pocas que han tenido la fortuna de estar afuera del planeta Tierra. Él es el astronauta de la NASA, Guy Gardner, que está aquí en Querétaro para compartir con nosotros sus experiencias. La entrevista será realizada en el idioma inglés, pero será subtitulada por mí y la subiré a mi canal en YouTube más adelante. Welcome, Guy. It's so good. nice to have you here. Good to be with you. How are you? Uh, I am good. I'm having a great time here. But I participated in different sports. I participated in my church, in my youth group, and I had a little job as a boy growing up too. I delivered papers. And so they were, I was a Boy Scout, and so the Academy was looking for people who could do well in school, but also did well in other areas of life as well. Which actually now I had never thought about this before. <laughs> but that's kind of what NASA was looking for in astronauts. It's not only people who had a good education and people who had done well in their career field, mine being that of a test pilot, but also people who could work as a team and get along with people well. That was very important in the job of being an astronaut. Definitely. You have to, to know about teamwork. Yes. Yes, very much. And adapt. Yeah, to and adapt. different uh, environments. Yes. We're, we're going to get there. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, was there a moment where you were about to give up on your dream of becoming an astronaut? Well, interestingly, um, in 1977, NASA announced they were accepting a new group of astronauts. They hadn't done that in over 10 years. And I was an instructor at the test pilot school at the time. And I applied. I uh, uh, was invited to come down for an interview to NASA. And all my friends knew that I was a shoe-in because of what I had done in my career. And uh, I wasn't so sure, but my friends were. Mm -hmm. So I went down. I interviewed. I came home. And then a few months later, when they made their selection, they called me and told me that I had not been selected. So my first try, I was not selected. And so I uh, had to think about, well, what am I going to do? So I put that dream aside and then uh, looked at what else I might do in my Air Force career and realized there were many th wonderful things and job opportunities that I could do. And so I started down doing that and finally became very happy with the realization that uh, there was a wonderful life I could have even though I couldn't fulfill my childhood dream. And then two years later, <laughs> I read in the paper that they were accepting applications again, and so I applied. And, uh, but with the realization that if I didn't get selected, that was okay. I had other things to do in life, and, but this time they picked me. So what do you think would have happened to you if there you had, didn't have this second chance? Well, I was, uh, I was an Air Force test pilot, and so I actually had an assignment to go to a, a management school okay. for a year, and then I was going to go back and work as a test pilot again. I thought about going back to college, getting a doctorate, and teaching at the Air Force Academy, and uh, working in an embassy. There was a test pilot job in the London Embassy, for example, and uh, there were just many, many roads in the Air Force. Uh, that I could go do, and of course, out in the civilian world, there were many wonderful things that anyone can do. So, I didn't know just where I would go, but I knew it would be a great life. And you, you have a, you have had a really exciting <laughs> life. Yeah. So, at your conference two nights ago, I had the opportunity to see your conference, yeah. and you asked us all to imagine that we were sitting in your place. And I, and I actually closed my eyes and I saw myself sitting. But I want you to tell me what you felt, what was on, in your mind and in your heart yeah. the first time that you were just stepping into the space shuttle. Yeah. Well, as, as I climbed in, of course, keep in mind that we have been training and training and training. And due to the delays in the space shuttle program, I was selected in 1980 and didn't fly until 1988. So, eight years later. So over eight years later, I finally got to climb into the space shuttle to blast off. And I had many friends, of course, who had flown before me. And uh, so I pretty much knew what it was going to be like due to the excellent training that we had. That still doesn't make it uh, a calm experience. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I was, uh, I got in. I, now mentally, I have a job to do. So I am busy mentally. Uh, and 
but you are definitely aware of the tremendous power that the space shuttle has. And so I was excited. Here I'm going to go fulfill my childhood dream and do it in a very spectacular way uh, with an element of risk as well. And so I was very excited. The risk side, I actually felt very much at peace. And I was very calm about it. And I think that has to do with both my experience, but even more so with my faith. I have a strong faith in God, and I felt I was where he wanted me to be, no matter what the outcome happened to, to be. So I was, I was at peace. If you can imagine that, I was very much at peace, but I was also very excited at the same time. So can you please tell the people that are actually watching us now live on, on live stream, how do you climb into this space shuttle? Because you, you have to crawl into the space shuttle. Right. And then you don't sit like we do in, on airplanes, no. on like the regular flights. You have to sit. Can yeah. you please to, uh, share with yeah. us? Yeah, well, of course, the shuttle landed like an airplane. Mm -hmm. And so the seats are seated up so that we can fly it mm -hmm. for a landing as an airplane. But for launch, the shuttle is tilted up 90 degrees. So you're actually lying on your back. Your seat is rotated. So you're lying on the back of the seat. You, you have a parachute on between you and the seat. Lying on your back and your feet and knees are up above you a little bit. And when you get into the shuttle, it's kind of fun to crawl in through the hatch because everything is turned 90 degrees. It'd be like walking into a room that somebody had turned on its side and all the chairs are bolted to what seems to be the wall. And, uh, and so then you have to crawl uh, across the, the back wall and then actually the flight deck, it's a, it's a two-story cockpit. There's the flight deck and what we call the mid-deck, and where the, you, the seats are for flying the shuttle, looking out the window, looking out at the payloads, uh, operating satellites, things like that. And then down below is where you eat and sleep and fix your food and all the storage is. So you actually have to, and when it's like this, you have to go up a ladder on the Earth. Of course, in space, you just float. Uh, <laughs> But when you're in launch, you actually crawl along the back wall up to the second floor, crawl in, and then you have to crawl up into your seat because it's at the front and uh, climb up on the back of the seat and strap in. You have somebody there to help you oh, okay. get your straps on and everything else. So you, you, you put some straps here, then you mentioned that you put some, uh, like a bucket, like a, a safety a belt. belt. Yeah. It's like a safety belt with two harnesses, and then even the strap between your legs mm -hmm. hooks into the buckle as well. It's kind of like a kid's seat for a car, okay. where they have all buckled in nice and tight. And what about the, the suit? The suit you wear in the shuttle is a uh, pressure suit. It's, uh, it's an orange suit you've seen in pictures of astronauts. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and it's designed to protect you in case you lose cabin pressure or if you have to, something goes wrong and you can get it down to where you can bail out with your parachute, chances are you'll land in the ocean, chances are it'll be very cold. And so it's to protect you also in case you land in the cold waters of an ocean before you can climb into your life raft. So, um, but it is hot, <laughs> it is tight, it's not particularly comfortable, but you wear it for your safety and protection. So now the countdown begins. Yes. And you can hear with your... Yeah, you can hear the countdown. You've got your earphones. Because you've got your helmet on, you're really isolated from hearing even your crewmates talk. So you talk to them over the... You've got two microphones for redundancy. that You can talk to your crewmates and, of course, to launch control. And then earphones so you can listen to them. And uh, so you're... Uh, there are times when you're just waiting because other people are doing things, the so launch control people, uh, that sort of thing. But other times, as the pilot astronaut, I have, I have things I have to do. I have to start the auxiliary power units and reconfigure some electrical switches and things like that. And then you sit there the last uh, two and a half minutes, you're just waiting right. and listening to the countdown. Things are happening. The shuttle is checking things out. And then, uh, and then you count down to launch. And then, of course, they light the main engines. There's three engines on the back of the shuttle itself that burns the fuel in the, the orange ones. tank. Yeah, well, the, yeah, these, they're huge. Mm -hmm. um, and they burn the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen in the orange tank. And then on the sides of the tank are what we call the solid rocket boosters, the white ones. And uh, when they ignite, you're going to take off because there's no holding them back. You can't shut them down. And, and, but the three main engines, you can shut them down if you want to. Uh, so they light them first and 
check them out seven seconds before liftoff. The computers check them because it happens too fast for a human. And if they look good, then they light the solids and away you go. And there's a, a lot of noise, a lot of shaking and vibration, and of course you're pushed back into your seat from the acceleration of the from rocket the, engines. Yeah. yeah, so it is quite an exciting ride, uh, just physically, you know, and, it, and it's a, you're shaking like this. I mean, it's quite a vibration that you feel from the solid boosters uh, firing. And, uh, and then, of course, it's still noisy, even though you're in your capsule inside your helmet. There's a good bit of noise that you still What hear. kind of a noise is it? Well, it's just a roaring. And, and then the solids actually burn with a little crackling sound. I don't know why, but that's the way the solid fuel burns. Crackling and then also a little bit not smooth. So that's why you have the, the vibrations that you feel. And uh, if you watch, if, if you're on the ground three miles away watching a launch where my wife got the watch from, you can actually, the, the noise is so loud that you can feel it in your chest. You can feel that vibration in your chest three miles away. So, so it is uh, quite an experience to, to have. So the countdown, you're up in the sky. Yeah. You're still inside the atmosphere. Right. What, what happens then? Well, after the, the boosters burn for about two minutes, and it gets you pretty much up above the thicker, certainly the thickest part of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And then they're out of fuel. They run out of fuel after two minutes. And then they are jettisoned off to the side. And, uh, and, but you continue to burn the fuel in the big orange tank. When the boosters drop off, it becomes very smooth, very quiet. Uh, uh, we would call it electric drive because you just don't feel like there's a motor but you can watch your instruments and you know you're going faster and faster and then you can still feel the acceleration pushing you back into your seat of course until you What's finish. the force that is pushing you? Um, the, uh, the acceleration from the boosters will give you a maximum of three G's we call it three times the force of gravity. Um, initially it's about one and a half G's when you first lift off, and then as the weight burns down, those G forces increase to a maximum of three. At the very end, the last minute of flight, we, we go for a total of eight and a half minutes. Two minutes on the solids along with the main engines, and then another six and a half minutes on just the main engines. And, uh, and in that time, you, the last minute, we actually have to throttle our engines down so we don't go over three Gs. Okay. The computers do that automatically. But, uh, so that holds us at three Gs. And we accelerate to 28,000 kilometers per hour, which is about eight kilometers a second. So it's very fast. It's very, very fast. We could have come to the studio very quickly yes. today. Uh, and when they shut the engines down, you instantly go from three G's being crushed back into your seat to zero G's and being weightless and floating. So it's, uh, it's quite an exciting experience and then it gets to be very fun when you're weightless. Do you remember, oh, of course you remember, but can you tell me about the first, first, first time that you saw the Earth from, from the outside? Well, of course I'd seen video and pictures that other astronauts have taken, so I, I knew what it was going to look like. but. Uh, First of all, during launch, now as pilot, if everything goes right, the computers take care of everything and I don't have to do a thing, the pilot and the commander. But we've trained thousands of hours in the simulator in case something goes wrong, because it's so complex a vehicle, there are many things that might go wrong. And if something goes wrong, I have to respond immediately, either reconfiguring switches, changing parameters on the computers, whatever is required. And so I have to be very vigilant watching what's going on so if something goes wrong I can respond immediately and get us back in a safe configuration. So mentally I'm very busy and I'm supposed to be paying attention to all my instrumentation. But as we went up you can't help but peek out the side window <laughs> and watch the sky very quickly go from blue to black. And then my first launch we went into what we call an inclination that's how much tilted to the equator we are of 57 degrees, which means we flew right up the east coast of the United States from Florida. And so as I looked where I was seated, as I looked out my window to the right, I could see the east coast of the United States going by below. Just quick peeks though. A quick one. Then once we, the engine shut down, we get off the external tank, then we, uh, then we can 
maneuver the shuttle to where we can look down at the Earth, and it's just an incredibly awesome experience to see that. I know that you you had to go to Vietnam, yes. and you were at the Air Force. Yeah, in the Air Force, as so a fighter pilot. What were you thinking? Because you flew to, you went to the space after you served yes. in Vietnam. How did it make you feel, the contrast, the different environment from being at war and then... Yeah, well, it's very different. Um, in the space shuttle, everyone was doing their best to make sure that it was as safe as practical for us on the shuttle. Everybody was rooting for us. Everybody was praying for us and our safety. In war, that's what war is. People are trying to kill you. Mm -hmm. So it's very different. Uh, and your objective is to inflict damage, sometimes loss of life, on them. So, very, very different. The, the war is not a place you want to be. Uh, it's not a thing you want to occur. And so, uh, very, very, very different. The risks, I think, were greater in war than they were flying the shuttle. Different. So, I mean, you're looking down at us. And did it make you, what did it make you feel? Did it make you sad about humankind? Or? No, actually there's a, for me, uh, and perhaps it has to do with my faith as well, but it's a very joyful experience mm -hmm. to be able to look at this creation. It was really fun to look out at the horizon and you can see the curvature of the earth out there. And the, the, uh, the atmosphere, of course, we're way above the visible part of the atmosphere where we can see it as it looks at blue. And so you see these bands of blue. I was surprised that it's not a continuous dark blue to light blue to nothing. Instead, they're almost distinct band shades of blue in little bands that go from dark to light to, to nothing. And, uh, and then at nighttime, there's another layer way above that that uh, glows a white. It's like a little white line that's up on top of that. And I don't know what that is. I think I read once what it's supposed to be, but it's, it's well above what we think of as our normal uh, thick part of the atmosphere. And so it was just, it was wonderful to look at that. And then, of course, looking down at the Earth and the beauty of the Earth. Uh, one of the earlier shuttle astronauts made a comment when he got back that I appreciated when I was up, is that you look down at the Earth and you don't see boundaries. You know, exactly. Those are man-made things, and they're arbitrary. And uh, so you get this much better sense of the wholeness of our planet. And, uh, and it's, it's very peaceful, you're weightless, you're floating there, and uh, there are none of the distractions of our everyday life. Uh, I mean, you have jobs to do, and, and uh, you're working on that while you're up, but it's, uh, it's a peaceful experience to float and look out at the Earth, particularly if it's like before you're going to bed and you've done all your daily duties and you're just relaxing before you go to sleep. And, uh, you know, the Earth, the topography of the Earth, the colors and the textures of the Earth are very different where places you go. The Andes Mountains, for me, were very distinct. They don't, you look down, you say, that's the Andes. Because they don't look like the Rocky Mountains. They don't look like, obviously, like the Himalayas or other mountains on the planet. Um, there are other deserts have different colors and different textures uh, as you go around the Earth. There's a place in China, you've probably seen pictures of being boats on a lake and then the mountains look like gumdrops. That's what they look like from space. <laughs> and that's the only place on the earth that I notice that they look that way. And so it's just, it's just a wonderful experience to, to look down and marvel at that beauty and uh, the uniqueness and the, and the variability of our planet. So, um you know that uh, lately we we've treating we've been treating the the earth not very nicely. Mm -hmm. All the climate change and yeah. you know, extinction of some species and hunting for trophies. Yeah. So, what would you like to say to people so that we can be aware and and start looking after the planet? Yeah, I th I think it's just uh, an appreciation for the gift that we've been given, planet Earth. And when you get to look at it with looking at those thin bands of blue atmosphere, they're very thin compared to the size of the planet that we live on. And I was just blown away by the realization of how fragile a place we live in this universe, this thin little layer that is designed to protect us and does. But the responsibilities, we flew over the, I didn't get any good pictures or views of the Amazon River Delta, because of the time of year, but also because of all the 
the burning that takes was taking place at that time in history, uh, at least, um, to to clear land for to grow crops, and uh, and so it was cloudy all the time and hazy all the time, and uh, and so in the other places on the planet where you can see erosion taking place because we haven't managed our land well enough, and some of that's through ignorance, which can be cured through education. Uh, but others of it is uh, that people aren't meaning to, c to create, you know, this environmental uh, destruction, if you will. They're just trying to make a living. I mean, they're trying to grow sustenance so that they can live and feed their children. And so I appreciate that. So it's, it's not just that we ban doing this and ban doing that and ban doing this. It's that how can we look at the planet as a whole? and figure out how we can meet the needs of people while still sustaining the planet on which we live and have been given as a gift. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a complicated, it's not an easy problem to solve. Yeah, I know. It's quite complicated. And education is a key. Too. Education is a huge key mm -hmm. to, to help them make it. Education of the farmers on how to better farm their land so they can reuse it but it's also education of the educated people to help us understand the better need that we have to work as a team and not as working as adversaries with the same goal of making sure that our children and our children's children and their children can inherit the wonderful planet that we've been able to enjoy. Definitely. Thank you. So a uh, few more questions. I'm almost done, don't worry. Yeah. I, I could be talking to you all day long. <laughs> That's okay, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> you too. You almost made me cry, by uh, the way. Um, the, when you, um, speaking about what you felt being out there, what makes you then happy about humankind or proud about us? Oh, humans? well, it's, I mean, I love humans. <laughs> Thank goodness, yes. since I am one. Uh, I mean, just my time here in Mexico is an example. Everyone I've met is wonderful. Everyone is real friendly, loving, caring, and uh, and so I think at our core, uh, we all we, we mean well. Sometimes though, our selfishness gets in the way. Sometimes our fear gets in the way, because fear is a good emotion if if you're being threatened. Uh, when you work with lions, uh, you know, you have to respect them and, uh, and their abilities. So, uh, so I am excited about humankind and the fact that, um, you know, God created us to be on this planet and take care of his planet. And I think if, as long as we can have that relationship with him, then we can have that guidance on how to better take care of his planet. And uh, my concern is, is if we push God aside, push him out of our lives, and try to do this on our own, that we will fail. I'm convinced we will fail. And, uh, and that's my concern. But, now, I run in circles. My friends, many are Christian, many are not. But they're all good people who, who want to do the right thing. And it's a matter of deciding, of figuring out what's the right thing, and I think through the Holy Spirit guide, guidance, that's how we figure that out. Um, speaking of your love for humankind, how do you meet Linda, your wife? How'd, I met Linda on a blind date in college. Did you? Yes. I went, the Air Force Academy at the time was all male, and she went to a school then called Colorado Women's College, which was all women. Mm -hmm. And uh, And so we had friends. I had a friend at, at school who was dating her roommate, and so they set us up together and we met on a blind date. Uh, was <laughs> well, it love on the first sight? Well, I was pretty much blown away by her at first. She's <laughs> I, Linda and Linda. She like is Linda, said. Linda. <laughs> Linda, Linda. <laughs> and, uh, but I think love takes time to grow and mature. I mean, we hit it off and, uh, and we figured out over time, not very long time, but uh, we were married a year, September, October, about a year and three months after we first met. Really? We were engaged about five months after we first met, five or six months after we first met. You knew she was the one? I knew she was the one, yeah. And was she, I, I can imagine she's been supportive about your... 
Well, she kind of knew this astronaut thing was in me when we first <laughs> were dating, even. So she knew that came with the package. <laughs> what a nice package. <laughs> and, uh, but she has put up with a lot. I mean, uh, uh, she has her own story to tell about God's uh, peace when she watched me launch. Uh, I mean, it is a lot harder to watch a loved one do something dangerous or with an element of risk than it is to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And so she had to do that, plus take care of our three kids during the process. And so I, I applaud her bravery much more than my own. Yeah, definitely, Linda. <laughs> I wish I could have another interview with you. <laughs> <laughs> she would be much better than I. <laughs> no, no, no. You were both are, are very charming. So you have three kids? Yes. And are you a grandpa? I'm a grandpa. Okay. I have three grandchildren from our oldest, our daughter, who is married and has three children. Do you want to uh, teach your, uh, your grandkids about this whole uh, astronaut? Oh, well, uh, well, they are in elementary school, so of course I've given my little talk in their schools. <laughs> they know that Grandpa was an astronaut mm -hmm. a long time ago, but uh, yeah, so they're well aware of that. You've been twice. Yes. Uh, the first time it was in 1988, right? And the second one was in 1990, right? One of them we cannot talk about it because it's a secret. Yep. <laughs> And we cannot say what we were, you were doing on the second I, one. I can say on the first one we launched a satellite from the space shuttle. But I just can't tell you what it was for. No. <laughs> no, no, no. And I know you're a man of integrity, which I, is yeah. what I love. I love your speech. Thank Please you. explain why you cannot tell. Uh, the story I told at the conference that uh, Carla is referring to is uh, a story of some young girls that I was speaking to. They were part of a group of young kids I was talking to. And, one of them wanted me to tell her what I, the secret of what the satellite was for. And I told her, I said, I can't tell you because if I told you a secret that you knew I wasn't supposed to tell you, then you couldn't trust me and I would lose your trust. And you couldn't tell me a secret because you know I tell secrets to people I'm not supposed to. <laughs> and so I haven't even told that to my wife what I've done. She said, you haven't? I said, no, I want my wife to trust me. I want her to know that, and I want to be a man of integrity that people can trust. And so, if you know I have a secret, then if I tell it to you, you can't trust me anymore. Mm -hmm. So, so when I know people have secrets that I'm not supposed to know, I don't want them to tell me, because then that would make them untrustworthy. I don't want them. I don't want to be the reason that they lost their integrity. Mm -hmm. So. So it was a fun story for the little girls, and the parents were there, and they were cheering. Yay! <laughs> we do need more integrity. Yes. In this, in this earth. So you've been out there. Yes. And you can see how infinite and visible and invisible yeah. our universe is. Yeah. How do you see our, ourselves as humans in this huge and never-ending... Yeah. Well, I, you know, I... I had an experience once actually flying in my little jet airplane when I was at NASA training to fly shuttles. And I was flying at night all by myself and uh, looking up at the clear night, beautiful stars above me. You could just, they were just blazing in the, blazing in the sky. And then even when you come watch them down to the horizon, they kind of blended in with the stars at the ground below. And I'm flying oh, it's just south of New Orleans and thinking of the million people of those lights down below me that they represented it. And none of them knew that I was flying above them or cared. Uh, and then the lights in the Mississippi Delta and out on the oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. And I was overwhelmed with how insignificant I am in this vast universe of ours. And then, but then, at the same moment, I was also overwhelmed with how great our God is, our Creator, that He knows me, loves me, cares for me and that I am very special in his sight, well, right. along with the other six billion people, on the six or seven billion people on the planet. Yes, but so, so that each one of us is very special, even though when you look at the big picture, we may appear to be insignificant. So there are seven billion significant people alive on the planet today. <laughs> Why did you call your conference uh, Universe Visible and Invisible? Well, I was asked to speak on that uh, once before when I was down in Honduras. And, uh, and so what I do is I talk about the way we look at the universe we see and what is visible 
and I do it kind of in three ways. Um, I talk about, first of all, I talk about the visible universe we see. At the conference I gave a little history from ancient Greeks and uh, Indians, Indians and Chinese who thought the universe was, that everything was made up of earth, water, fire, air, and so forth. And then the first Greek who thought, well, it's made up of tiny building blocks, and he gave them the name atoms, even though he, or atomos, even though he did not, could not see them, he just imagined that's what they were. And how over the hundreds and hundreds of years of developing better mathematics, better, better um, uh, telescopes, microscopes, we have learned more and more that the atom's not the basic building block, it's made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons, and then we think that's the way the universe is made, and then we discover, well, no, there are smaller particles that make up protons and neutrons. They're called quarks and things like that. Um, and so, and then looking at the big picture of the universe, the Earth's not the center of the universe, the sun is not even the center of the universe, and so forth. And so showing how as we look at our visible universe, we learn more and more and more with the caution that when we learn all this, these things we know about our universe, we have to be very careful that we don't assume we know it all. <laughs> that there's some years after us, somebody's going to come along and say, well, you know what, either they were flat wrong in that area, or it just needs to be tweaked a little bit, modified a little bit. And so that was the part of the visible universe. And I talked about black holes and, and dark energy, which is part of the un invisible universe that we kind of know about, but we don't know what those things are, as well as a lot of other questions. We don't understand gravity very well. Um, we uh, don't understand the, the quarks. The, why are there six of them? Why are only two of them stable? You know, why aren't there 10? Why aren't there only two? You know, there's a lot of questions we don't know. So that invisible part of the universe is the knowledge that we don't understand. And I talked about not only things we know we don't know, but there's probably a lot more that we don't know yet that we don't know. Um, then I, I have fun with thinking about what a fourth dimension, fourth physical dimension would be like. You know, we see in three dimensions, what would a fourth dimension look like? That's invisible to us. Does it exist? Some of the big bang theories, string theory in particular, thinks the universe started with 10 dimensions, physical dimensions. So what does that invisible thing look like? And then the third point is another part of the invisible universe is the spiritual dimension that we can't see, but interestingly, over the thousands and thousands of years that humans have existed, they have felt and experienced this, this, this uh, spiritual universe, and I am one of those as well. I mean, that's where my faith derives from, is the spiritual universe dimension. Speaking about spiritual um, dim dimension, I have, a, uh, I have followers on my Facebook fan page, and I asked them this morning to please send me a question for you. And uh, I chose just one okay. of the questions, and it's from a lady in Veracruz. Uh -huh. You know where Veracruz is? Yes. Right? It's in the Gulf of uh, right. Mexico. And she's, she said, what role does your spiritual life play in your experiences lived in the outer space? Uh, but my, my uh, spiritual life, my faith in God, plays a huge role. It's who I am. It's, 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 it completes me. It, uh, I believe my relationship with God is my number one priority. Because and, ex and that relationship allows me to experience His love, which fills me, and then allows me to love others as a result of that. And so my enjoyment of other people comes from my faith in God and the love that He fills me with that then I share and now able to share with others. And so uh, uh, since I have this relationship with God, I can't tell you what it would be like to not have it. I have had periods in my life where I drifted a little bit away from that relationship. I was never a you know, I was not a bad, what you call a bad person, but I was just distant and empty. And so, uh, and then so I have to renew my relationship and get back in, in my fellowship with my Creator. And then that fills me up and allows me then to share that love with other people. And so, in the question, it's a huge part mm -hmm. of my, to be able to look at the earth from space is a tremendous experience for anyone. To view our planet from a perspective that so far only about five or six hundred people have had the opportunity to do 
is incredible. But to be able to do that and at the same time have a relationship with the one who created it is just awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Words now. <laughs> I'm sitting next to you and on this page. <laughs> so uh, one last one. Um, describe the planet in one word. Is what? Describe our planet in one word. Beautiful. And your experience out there in one word. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> and one experience that we, you will always remember. The, the biggest one, the most amazing experience when you were out there. Um, can I do more than one word? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Before I flew, we were allowed to take up um, little mementos from our family and, and from organizations. And uh, so I flew some things for my wife and my children and my mom and so forth. And then uh, and for some organizations that have meant special things to us, you know, alma maters and then and, but also there's a Christian radio station in Houston called KSBJ. So I flew a picture of, of their staff for them. They have to be small and lightweight. <laughs> we also could take up, back then we took Walkman. Walkman? Yes, little I remember cassette the tapes. Yes, of course. And we could take, uh, I don't know, four or five cassette tapes of our music, whatever we wanted. And uh, I, I made a couple of them, but then I asked uh, KSBJ if they would make up a tape of music because they would have songs I didn't have and they would be better quality than I could make. And uh, I didn't listen to the tape until I got in orbit. So my, after my first day in orbit, very long day, very tiring day, getting the satellite deployed. Um, at night when I went to sleep, uh, Hoot Gibson, my commander and I, we decided to sleep in our seats up on the flight deck so we could float there with the seat belt loosely fastened around us, looking out at the earth going by below out the front window because we happened to be in an attitude where we were pointed straight down. So okay. we could just look out and there's the earth going by. Mm -hmm. And I remember we were going by uh, equatorial Africa we're in the region of uh, the Rift Valley region, which is an area of very ancient volcanic and activity, uh, very rugged terrain, but beautiful in its colors and its textures. Going up over the Himalaya Mountains, Siberia, Russia, with all in December with the snow, and then out over the Pacific, looking at the atolls in the Pacific. All this is in 45 minutes. And, uh, and I put my KSBJ tape, KSBJ tape in and listened to it. And instead of just music, each of the DJs and the station manager and the people who worked at the station took turns. And they gave me words of encouragement, a scripture, and a song. Oh, no. Words of encouragement, a scripture, and a song. And as I listened to that, looking at this beautiful planet going by below, and thinking of my relationship and enjoying my fellowship with the Creator, it was very, very <laughs> special. <laughs> You're, You're going to make me cry now. <laughs> well, I cried. I cry now. You're making me cry. Um, and interestingly enough, as I'm listening to this and the tears well up in my eyes, of course, being weightless, they don't roll down my cheek. They just bubble up on my eye, <laughs> and I have to wipe them off so I can see. <laughs> oh, what a beautiful experience. What, an, what a nice surprise, wasn't it? Yeah. That, that's the one that you won't remember. I, I won't remember either. It wasn't there. <laughs> so, Thank you, Carl. Um, one, something that you would like to add? I know you have to go now. You have to go see um, more of Mexico. Just, just to your listeners, your viewers, that um, I just encourage you if, you, if you have a relationship with God, if you believe in God, that you focus on that relationship with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, with the Father, and, uh, and put that as a priority to get to feel close to them. And, and because he's there, wants to be close to you. And then if you're not a believer, you don't think there's a God, well, I encourage you to investigate. Yes. Talk to God. I won't convince you to, that there's a God, mm -hmm. but God can convince you that he is real. You just need to ask him to do so. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to my, meet you. My pleasure to be and with you. My probably. best wishes to you and your Thank lovely you. family. Thank you. And you're one of the few very special human beings Oh, no. I will never uh, forget. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. But thank there you are so seven much. billion of us. There are seven billion of us, yes. <laughs> I need to meet them all now. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much, You're guys. welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Y muchas gracias a los que nos mandaron sus preguntas a través de mi página en Facebook. Y les recuerdo, esta entrevista será subtitulada al español y la subiré a mi canal en YouTube. Thank you very much, Kai. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Gracias.